Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Wavelength, sparking the combos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Welcome to Wavelength, sparking the combos about Adelaide you should be having. I am your host, Cass, and while Alex is away, I'm joined by the gorgeous Maggie, and we're going to take you through all the way to 7pm with some super interesting stories. It's our first show back to weekly, and it feels so good, hey? It feels great. How's your weekend been, Max? Yeah, good. I'm actually coming off the back of a a big weekend. Good. Had my football prezos on the weekend, which is always good. Good to see the girls and have a few beers. Yeah, Yeah. always great. I've had a very quiet weekend, but my my boyfriend did repair my car for me oh, bless. and I got it back and he's like he scrubbed my rims <gasps> he scrubbed my license plate this man's an angel you're kidding how know, good he doesn't do a lot for me but what he does he, he does it well he does well anyway let's get into it shall we once again it's been a big week of news and we have a super interesting show for you this week Kieran takes us through sexual health week talking about personal HIV testing and the syphilis rise and later on our new recruit Charlotte takes you through the wine excess in Adelaide and Kate takes you through all the good news that happened this week. But before we get into all of that, Kate talks to Tim Costello, the CEO of World Vision. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Tim, you're such a huge voice when it comes to social justice issues, but in a world with so many humanitarian crises, where do you begin? Well, you begin in your neighbourhood. Charity does begin at home, but it doesn't end at home. I learned compassion from watching my mother and my father welcoming people who were excluded in our neighbourhood growing up as a kid, having extra uh, seats at the table to feed them. And I realised that real joy actually comes from giving and embracing and serving and responding rather than accumulating and succeeding. And Kierkegaard said that the door to happiness turns outwards. And I think I learned early on that turning outwards and responding fulfills my my deepest humanity and actually brings me joy. That's a really lovely way of putting it. So at what point in your life did you start helping out humanity in small or big ways? Well, I went to be a lawyer because I was obsessed with the question of justice. I, I apparently asked a very good question in Year 9. I say um, that with surprise because I didn't know I could ask a good question and I didn't know, a teacher didn't know the answer. <laughs> But the question was, is poverty natural or is poverty created? If poverty is natural, you can't challenge nature, so you just resign yourself to it. If poverty is because of the rules we wrote, well, we can have different rules and I can advocate and change some of those rules that include people who are excluded because of racism or sexism, disability or whatever it is, their difference. So I think studying law for me was pursuing justice. How do I change the rules? And in my legal practice, working as a um, storefront poverty lawyer, not being paid much, but working for people who otherwise couldn't afford a lawyer, was where it began for me. Around the world, people are facing poverty, social issues, environmental issues. Are these things we should tackle one by one, or are they all just connected? Yes, so from my faith, I think there are three things that are always going on. Our relationship to God now. Lots of people don't believe in God, but for me, that's important to say, if God's image is in every human, whenever I encounter another human, I'm encountering something of God. They have dignity, and I'm not to feel superior or judge them. Secondly, our relationship to each other, gross inequity. Thirdly, our relationship to the planet, to nature. And I think when there's distortion in those three things, we end up with climate change, we end up with inequality, where the poor are living on the worst land, most ravaged by climate change, that floods because it's the most degraded land or burns, because of our distorted relationship to other humans, saying your fate shouldn't be determined by the lottery of latitude, that where you're born determines whether you'll live, which is how it is for so many who are poor and then climate change intensifies that. So disproportionately the poor who we have had power over and neglected are the most disproportionately impacted by climate change already. So I think we've got to get relationships right. That's where I start and how I see it. 
You mentioned climate change, and sometimes we look to governments or corporations to change their ways. But can we rely on other people, or is there a bit of teamwork involved to help keep our place on this planet? Yeah, no. Hu- human progress has ever, only ever been made by humans listening to their conscience. Freedoms that we have are because of human conscience and people then collaborating together. The conscience that says. It's not right that my children get far more calories a day than they need, and yet another mother can't guarantee enough calories and food for their child, and they're suffering malnutrition. The collaborating on climate change requires the conscience of all of us to say the next generation are being left with the legacy of our greed, and we, particularly in the developed Western world, who don't want to give up any of our lifestyle, we put most of the carbon up there. So the question, who really owns the sky, is the question of climate change. And the poorer nations are saying, well, we have a right to develop, lift people out of poverty, but you put all the carbon up there, and you won't cut back and make sacrifices. That's the relational justice question that we have to solve to also deal with climate change. And in the future, moving forward, Tim, do you have a vision for the world? What is your world vision? Uh, Look, at one level, what we call the Sustainable Development Goals are the world vision. We've mapped out what we have to deal with with those goals. And by 2030, if we actually took those goals seriously, we could get there. Their predecessor was the Millennium Development Goals. That was from the year 2000 to 2015. We dramatically reduced poverty and hunger by the world focusing on seven millennium development goals. We've written more that particularly include climate change called the sustainable development goals. So we have a blueprint. The question is, will we let our conscience drive our actions? So I have to consume less red meat. (laughs) I have to look at my carbon footprint and I have to be prepared to pay more tax. In Australia, no one wants to pay more tax, but more tax so that there is renewable energy and care for the world's poor. And that comes down to me and my conscience saying, there's something I can do. And together, listening to our conscience. And taking it back to your first comment about opening the door outwards, for those listening on Fresh 92.7 right now, would you say that, yes, paying more taxes and cutting down those red meat and taking those selfless attitudes um, will make people feel better in the long run? Absolutely. This is the irony (laughs) that um, it sounds like it's hair shirt punishment and sacrifice. I believe in beauty and sensuality and good things, absolutely. However, I also believe that how much food can any one of us eat. You know, going back to my uh, kitchen table with my parents, it was sheer joy seeing people being welcomed into a family and treated as if they were part of the family when they'd been excluded. The joy I felt seeing their sense that they mattered. You know, humans only really have one question. The question is, do I matter? It's a great joy when you're able to give that gift to another human that you matter and I've made choices to show that you matter. It's an absolute honour speaking to you, Tim Costello. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Wonderful. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Amazing. That was Kate in conversation with Reverend Tim Costello after his speech on global issues at the Adelaide Town Hall. Some really great ideas there. Don't go anywhere. Up next, Kieran talks with Nikki Brandon from Shine SA. You're listening to Wavelength here on Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. The 12th to the 18th of September was Sexual Health Awareness Week, and with the rise of syphilis and other STIs, it can be hard to understand how to protect yourself. Kieran speaks with Nikki Brandon from Shine SA to learn more. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Hi, yeah, I'm Nikki Brandon. I'm a sexual health nurse and the manager of the clinical and community education team at Shine SA. So, Nikki, what does Shine SA do primarily? So, Shine SA is all about sexual health and relationship wellbeing for all. S H I N E stands for Sexual Health Information Networking and Education. We offer sexual and reproductive health services as well as education services. So, in our clinics, we provide comprehensive sexual and reproductive health. We test and treat for sexually transmitted infections 
infections. We provide ongoing management where needed, including PrEP for protection against HIV. We provide all types of contraceptions. We also offer emergency contraception and PET. Both of these are time-sensitive treatments that can be used to prevent an unintended pregnancy or HIV respectively. We have sexual health counsellors who are able to talk through a range of sexual health issues. And we have a gender wellbeing service for trans and gender diverse people. Additionally, if you're after someone to call about a sexual health issue, we have a free sexual health line which can be used by the public or health professionals. And all of our clinical services and the sexual health line can be accessed without a referral. And then our education side of things, um, we provide sexual health and relationship wellbeing training. and We deliver this training to teachers, doctors, nurses and community sector workers. Now, last week was Sexual Health Awareness Week. Shine SA announced the theme Better in Bed. Can you explain what that is for our listeners? Yeah, sure. So the theme Better in Bed is all about being our best selves when it comes to relationships and sex. It's about safety, pleasure and respect. We want people to be thinking, you know, how can we communicate better to have better sex? Or, you know, how can we make sure we have enthusiastic consent? And, you know, how can we have more pleasure in our relationships? Australia has seen an increase in syphilis outbreaks. How can people stay protected and safe? The rising syphilis cases in South Australia it is concerning. It's really important that we have safer sex, not just for the sake of ourselves, um, but for our community in general. And syphilis has really serious consequences if untreated and it can be passed on to a baby. The best way to protect yourself against syphilis and most STIs is by using um, protection such as condoms or dams. It's also a good idea to get tested regularly for STIs and as a general rule, once a year or, or with a change of every sexual partner. Now, you mentioned getting tested. There is a lot of stigma around STIs and getting checked. How can we combat this? So by having conversations like this, um, this is all part of combating STIs. Um, coming from the perspective of, of a sexual health nurse, um, people need to know that STIs are very common and the more we talk about the testing and the protection, um, the less stigma we will have. Also making sure people People have access um, to the correct information rather than what people do with Dr. Google. And of course, removing the stigma from STIs and sex in general is going to help us be healthier and ultimately better in bed. So where can our listeners go if they want to learn more? Uh, we've got uh, Shine SA, we've got a website, dinasa.org.au that's got lots of up-to-date information and um, for the public and health professionals, um, such as news blogs and fact sheets. And it has all our information there, including the sexual health line number. So it's a good place to start looking for information. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thanks for that, Kieran and Nikki. Let's get right back into the jams. You're listening to Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome to Wavelength, sparking the combos about Adelaide you should be having. Before the break, you heard Kieran speak with Nikki Brandon from Shine SA about the syphilis rise in Australia. You may have seen on the news that HIV self-testing kits have entered Australia, which can help people stay protected and protect others from HIV. To understand more, Kieran spoke with Dr Nikki Sullivan about making free HIV testing available to at-risk groups in Adelaide. Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. My name's Dr Nikki Sullivan and I'm the project coordinator of the Connect Project here at Samish. What is the Connect Project? So the Connect project is a pilot project that was funded by the federal government as part of the activities to support the national response to bloodborne viruses and sexually transmissible infections. It's a 12 month long pilot project looking at the efficacy of using vending machines to dispense free HIV self test kits to target groups, in particular people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, men who have sex with men from those backgrounds, international students and migrants. How has the project been received within the community? Well, incredibly, we are just absolutely blown away by the uptake. Our machines went into university campuses and Adelaide's uh, only sex on premises venue in mid-March and to date we've had about 770 people register to use the Connect machines and we've dispensed about 790 free self-test kits, which is amazing. Wow, so we'd call that a success. Absolutely. I mean, one of the main aims of this has been to, well, to increase the HIV testing amongst people who either were infrequent testers or non-testers. HIV response in recent years has been geared towards prevention and management with drugs like PrEP and PEP. Was there a gap where testing was missing? Well, I think what we know is that 
sexual health services and other health providers have done a really fantastic job at engaging really high risk groups. But we do know that there are groups that we have found it harder to engage and that oftentimes people in those and other at risk groups don't find out their status until quite late on. And the trouble with that is that, you know, if you don't know your status, then you're more likely to actually pass on HIV to others. And so this project is really about trying to get those very difficult to reach communities, the communities that the health sector has not been as good at at reaching around sexual health. What are some of the barriers to reaching these groups? Are they social, language barriers? There's all sorts of things like cultural norms, low levels of sexual health literacy, language and communication, negative experience with health providers, you know, gender norms. So people from some cultures would be very cautious about talking to somebody who wasn't the same gender as them. There's all sorts of barriers and this project really targets those by making uh, these tests available. People can come and get one free of charge. They don't have to actually talk to anybody. They take them home. They do them in the privacy of their own home. We provide all of the information that people need to do the test and then to do any follow-up testing. But yeah, we actually take away a whole range of those barriers that are proven to have uh, inhibited testing in the past. As the pilot program is reaching the end of the 12 months, will Connect be extended or expanded? So our testing period ends at the end of September. We then have to report to the Commonwealth, but we are currently in negotiations with the universities and the SORNA around extending the life of machines on campus. The universities are really keen to keep them there and they're proven so successful and such an integral part of students' health and well-being that there's definitely a push to keep them there so that is something we're in discussion about at the moment and fingers crossed they might be there through to the end of next year with any luck. So where can listeners get more information about the project? Uh, So you go to the SAMESH website and look for the Connect project or you can go directly to it hivconnect.org.au Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thanks for that, Kieran and Dr. Sullivan. It's a super interesting interview and I feel like there's so many stigmas with um, just STIs in general. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like there's a lot of misinformation as well. So it's super good to be having these conversations to kind of get rid of that stigma. Yeah, absolutely. And like getting tested, it's not a scary thing and it's not abnormal that you and your friends should be getting tested regularly and you should feel want, you should want to feel protected with the people that you're with. Exactly. It's all about being safe and yeah it's super quick and easy so so up next our newest journo shah talks us through the wine excess problem in sa don't go anywhere you're here on fresh wavelength Welcome back to Wavelength. Recently, wineries have expressed concern that there will be thousands of litres in excess wine due to a drop in demand. To learn more, Shah takes you through it. Wavelength explains on Fresh 92.7. With rising tensions in international trade, the wine industry is the latest to fall due to the complications of exports with China. Tariffs on Australian wine from China have created an oversupply of red wine and led to a decrease in red grape prices. This pan is expected to fall into the 2023 vintage. Due to such a large oversupply of roughly 400 million litres of red wine in Australia at this current point in time, Riverland grape growers are being encouraged to delay their vines or switch varieties altogether to avoid the harsh curve thrown at the viticulture industry. Lee Warren of Bleasdale Winery speaks to us about this issue. Uh, Well, it's a a huge issue actually and going to come to the surface at some stage because uh, the reality is in the last 12 months Australia's produced twice as much wine as we've actually sold so that's not a sustainable model um, by any means and there's the forecast for the next couple of vintages are exactly the same so the problem we've got at the moment is wine tanks around the country are full um, pretty much everywhere and the prices because the supply and demand is so out of whack since China it's their tariff on Australian wine so there was over a billion dollars of, of wine being sold to China and when, when they put their tariffs on that that volume went away and that volume hasn't been replaced and you know I feel sorry for a lot of the growers you know the traders that are dealing with China they'll move on they'll move on and do other things but the uh, 
the but the growers are the ones that have the infrastructure in the ground, the grapes and the vines in the ground. Um, they're the ones that are carrying the overhead and are going to have to yeah basically uh, you know either make a loss or decide not to pick their grapes and because there's no real, real place for their fruit to go. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thanks for that, Shah. Before hearing that, I really never thought you could have too much wine. No, I reckon me and the girls could help them out. <laughs> we could go down to McLarenville. We'll let them know. Give us a call. Yeah. Well, last week, Hindley Street got a brand new music venue. The Hindley Street Music Hall opened with a bang last Thursday. Kate talks you through all the changes in heaps good news. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Right now we have Kate for Heaps Good News. I know there's gonna be... Heaps Good News on Wavelength. You might have vague Saturday night or early Sunday morning mems inside HQ. Well, after relocating from the corner of North and West Terrace in 17, HQ on Hindley didn't quite do it for punters. So the hard-hatted men came and left and the music lovers rolled in to create Hindley Street Music Hall. Out with the old, but an opportunity to reminisce on HQ. Definitely served its purpose in its time, hosting numerous fresh parties and some of the biggest acts. Even Snoop Dogg played there. Started off as heaven in 93, was the place for Adelaide folk to hear freshly spun vinyl, drink, dance and grind on fellow humans. Heaven ran till the early noughties and then HQ was born. So the party scene remains on the Hindley Street strip, but the memories of the original HQ still beats the EQ of our fresh mates' hearts. Let's hear the eulogies. You get hit with that smell first of all, and then you know you're home. Pretty well guaranteed it'll be a big night. Core memories of my first ever raving days in just an amazing, huge super club. The old hospital, bus stop out the front of there, covered in vomit. I knew the only way I could get home is if I took my clothes off and turned them inside out, and then get on the bus home. That was probably one of the best fresh parties we ever had. One of his famous photos was him lying on the ground with the disco ball dropped on top of it. Prime time for electronic music floating around on this wild adventure but you're in the same nightclub it felt like every area was a different place every show had like hundreds of people there I remember Lee Steve playing and just like playing tracks i never heard anyone was kind of welcome there which was fun the choice was probably the biggest thing that blew my mind get your fix of different music at HQ what an amazing room and sound and light they had there used to be a big mirror ball that was donated to them by Madonna it was the absolute club being faithful of Adelaide. They used to literally credit on MTV. Well, I didn't try and be anything it wasn't, like it was daggy and it smelled awful and that's what was great about it. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thanks for that, Kate. And that brings us to the end of the show tonight. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you're subscribed to the Wavelength podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now, and tonight's episode will be up soon. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another episode, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Wavelength. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.